Good morning, everybody. My name's Chris Davis from Engage Insight, and welcome to our festive 12 Days of Mifid 2. The reason why we're making it festive is not just because it's Christmas is around the corner, but also because Mifid 2 can be a tad dry, and um, I've tried to read it before uh, going to bed at night, and it has sent me to sleep a couple of times. So we're, we're attempting to break it all down into, into bite-sized chunks and so can you can uh, sense check against your businesses to make sure that you're on track, which I'm sure you all are, um, and really give you a flavour for um, the interpretation of MIFID 2 um, as from a regulatory perspective, but also a, a uh, industry perspective um, because we as a business do a lot of research into the industry. We've researched over 600 firms nationally um, around key issues, regulatory issues such as MIFID 2, GDPR, SMCR, suitability, treating customers fairly and know your client and the rest of it. So um, hopefully it will be a sense check for where you currently are. Before we all do that, what I'd like to ensure is that you are on uh, line, you can see the screen and also uh, you can hear me in my dulcet tones. Um, you, the, the, the green icons at the top of your screen really give you an idea um, for uh, what you, um, how you can control um, what you're seeing and hearing. And if you go into the audio mode, um, check your audio, make sure your computer's working and set up. Um, and also, if you can't hear, dial in using that uh, call number, phone number, and you, you should be able to hear. So I uh, hope all, uh, you're all on board and the technology works for you. Who am I? My name's Chris Davis. I'm Managing Director of Engage Insight. And um, really, we were a, a, comp a compliance and business development consultancy. Uh, we have been around now for three years. We help IFAs, wealth managers, banks with their compliance business, uh, client-centric cent client um, uh, service proposition needs. And we have, over the last 18 months, uh, built and developed um, one of a first of its kind reg tech platform called Model Office Mo. And what Mo does is allow you to sense check where you sit, benchmark yourself against all the reg regulations and your peers, um, and find out um, instantaneously uh, what strategies, steers, and guidance you need to improve your ongoing performance to make sure you're highly compliant, client centric, and sustainable as a professional practice. But more about that later. The agenda for today is really simple. What we're going to do is talk about uh, what is MIFID 2, um, break it down into these bite, 12 bite-sized chunks representing the 12 days of Christmas, um, and also talk about how RegTech can help with that, um, talk about why and how you are going to be affected by this, um, look at uh, where, where RegTech can help with advisor, planner firms, and uh, wealth management sectors, and then tips for employing um, RegTech and how it can help, particularly in this case regarding MIFID 2, going forward. Uh, what is RegTech? Well, uh, RegTech can help in a multitude of areas. Re really, RegTech is techn any, any technology that helps you make sense of the regulations and helps you with your regular reporting uh, data. Um, so, so really, we're all about um, in interpretation of regulations and enhancing your, your reporting, as you'll see. Um, but there's also data access, storage management. There's fintech startups. So here, you know, where RegTech can help, for example, is with robo-advisors. Um, and their algorithms that they kick out, what RegTech can help is actually you make sense of uh, how these algorithms are constructed to make sure that the, the portfolios that they're uh, recommending, if you like, are completely suitable for your own client needs. Uh, fraud prevention, detection, cybercrime, um, and risk management are the other key areas. Um, what is MIFID 2? Before we, let's put some context around this. Well, MIFID 2 is really into two, is divided into two parts. The first part is looking at um, uh, MIFID 2 as a directive and, 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 well, the first part really, sorry, should I say, is, is a regulation, MIFA, um, and then you've got um, the MIFID 2 directive that sits underneath that. Um, certainly, the, the, the regulatory piece um, is directly applicable to each member state in, 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 the Euro, in, in, in Europe, and even though we're leaving Europe uh, potentially in 2019, um, this will still affect uh, us as we go forward. It's not quite gold plated across, but certainly, you know, a lot of the large parts of MIFID 2 are being written into the FCA rulebook. Um, then we've got the fact that um, the FCA uh, are not necessarily copying out MIFA into the handbook, but they're certainly signposting MIFA obligations and updating readers' guides. Um, so affected firms will need to be aware of that as this goes forward. 
Who is affected? Well, investment firms, market operators, data reporting, service uh, providers. Uh, we're all in this sphere of Article 3 exempted firms, which is good news because, you know, obviously a lot of it, you know, or, or, or some parts of it aren't going to be a, a, um, applicable to, to your business, which is great news. Um, but you need to be aware of what is uh, and, and obviously aware of how you can sense check it and, 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 and make sure that it's, it's offering you opportunity. Um, not just a challenge in, in the business as you go forward. An Article 3 exempted firms, I'm sure you know, is any firm that does not hold client funds, securities, it does not provide any uh, in investment of service other than reception and transmission of, of orders at, or investment advice, uh, or both in relation to transfer of securities units and collective investment undertakings. So, so really, Article 3 firms is where we sit, and, and that's the word we sit, and we'll talk about um, what are the key issues um, that are affecting you in these 12 12 key areas. Um, whenever I talk about MIFID 2, people tend to look at me like this, uh, like monks scream. And, and the key area here is, is look, you know, MIFID 2, the good news is it's, you know, it's not a cliff edge approach. We've got 12 months really from January to get it all right in the business. Uh, so from that perspective, it's, 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 it's good. Um, and where the model office, our reg tech um, platform sits, it can help uh, signpost, uh, uh, give you warnings of any gaps, uh, of any blind spots in the business and knowledge and steers and strategies about how to improve across uh, across these 12 areas. So the real emphasis here is is don't panic. You know, I'm sure you've done a lot of good work in the business. Um, that will all, um, you know, needs to be sense checked as we can against these 12 key areas. Um, but the key issue is, is that the regulations as the best way to look at the regulations is really like a jigsaw. They all fit in together, as we'll talk about when we talk about these 12 key areas. So from that perspective, you know, the good news is, is that um, is that you've done a lot of hard work already. And it's all a case of doing is sense checking what you've done to make sure that you're moving it, moving it forward appropriately uh, with all the regulations that are coming down the line um, and also making sure that um, you're, you're really um, interpreting the rules in the right way. So the first day of MIFID 2, we're, we're gonna be speaking about treating customers fairly. And, and really what we call treating customers fairly in MIFID 2 is really treating customers fairly on speed. And the six outcomes that you've got there of treating customers fairly, you've got the first outcome where it's the fair treatment of customers and it is a key part of corporate culture. So cultures vary and conduct are the two key areas that are very important here um, and you'll, you'll, you've will you seen the FCA do a lot of, of work around uh, what culture means and conduct is and we don't think they've done enough. Um, there was a, a great speech by Tracy McDermott to the British Bankers Association in uh, 2015 where she talked about I think it was three to five areas of of how to assess conduct and culture uh, and she talked about you know uh, what risks, identifying the risks, who's responsible for those risks what mechanisms you have in place to manage uh, those risks as you go forward, uh, perverse incentives, uh, any, you know, look at the incentive structure that you've got within the business and, and also board oversight to make sure that is a, an investment committee oversight uh, to make sure any biases, et cetera, are managed. So really, that's a really good indicator for outcome one. And that is very much at the center of MIFID two. Um, outcome two is all about design to meet their uh, customer needs and that they're, they're targeted accordingly. We'll talk about outcome two a little bit later when we talk about prod, product governance, because uh, that's a, a blind spot in more ways than one in MIFID two. People just um, tend to discount that, but we'll talk about that because it's, it doesn't just apply to the product manufacturers. Outcome three, clear information um, and are kept in, uh, clients are kept informed. Uh, disclosure, we'll talk about uh, regarding that. And then outcome four, Suitable advice takes account of their circumstances. Well, obviously you need to review your advice suitability uh, records annually now with MIFID 2. So again, we'll talk about that. Outcome five led uh, to expect the service at acceptable standard. And outcome six is post-sale barriers, um, which again, really make up um, a lot of what MIFID 2 is all about regarding service, uh, clients, uh, client recording client communications and so forth. The other issue regarding this is know your customer and um, uh, Chris Hewitt uh, from the FCA gave a really good speech a couple of um, months ago at a, at a function we were at, and I just thought this is quite interesting. Um, and he talked about the, um, the need to drill down, the need to get more granular information on clients from a soft pack point of view. For, you know, we have a, 
uh, a program which is CPD accredited, which is a professional skills development framework program, which focuses on listening skills, uh, questioning skills, coaching skills, consultative skills. Uh, and that is really about getting far more soft facts from clients so you put more meat to the bone so you get to know them far better. And obviously that's going to help you with your advice and suitability requirements going forward regarding MIFID 2. So day two really is all about disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. And, and here, you know, if you're buying a property, it's all about location, location, location. Um, same with, with MIFID 2, one of the big foundation stones really of MIFID 2. And the key area here is the FCA, I don't think quite um, trust the industry at this stage. Their business plan this year going into next year stipulated relatively few advisors are transparent about their pricing before they sell advice. Um, the suitability review that came out in May or June this year um, from the FCA also focused on the fact that I think it was 41% of firms fell short on, on disclosure requirements, yet I think it was 91% of firms were doing, you know, had a big green uh, uh, green light thumbs up on, on suitability um, on their file checks. So certainly uh, disclosure is something that we need to focus on. And here's an example of how a firm has done that, moved into a, a tiered segmented client approach, showing what clients get, the services that they'll get for it, and showing what the, the costs are broken down in an aggregated format um, and in pounds and pence. So, so really that's what Miffy2 wants, wants, wants to see. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are doing that uh, anyway, but it's good to keep sense checking to know um, what the F, you know how you how you're going against what Miffy two is demanding. Day three communications are at least analogous. Well, what we're talking about there is uniformity across the business. This is a big risk. We've seen a lot of firms in the marketplace where one person is is recording client communications in one way and another person in a completely completely different way. You can't do that. It, it has to be all uniform, streamlined across the business. One of the best ways to do it is using technology, practice management technology, turnkey technology. To do that, making sure your technology talks to each other, whether you're using ATR tools, cash flow modeling tools, and back office practice and CRM systems, how can you get all that um, to talk um, and, and, and record information uniformly? Um, a lot of advisors now are moving down the line and planners are moving down the line to using client portals, which again can help. It can also help with GDPR, where you're recording um, the data and, and getting the data um, protected and um, uh, and uh, encrypted so so that is all that's how it, all this jigsaw effect fits in but here we're talking about centralized non-siloed data storage for communications across the business centrally managed retention policies all communications are searchable easily all communications readily available uh, for compliance teams and auditors provide quick cost-effective distribute solution and also avoiding swivel chair compliance what does that mean well a lot of the banks in particular that we see tend to offer uh, multiple disparate solutions for their compliance obligations and that can create issues um, because it's like having too many clocks on the wall it's very difficult to tell the time if they're out of sync so that is the principle we're talking about here is it's streamlining using for example regtech where you can streamline your compliance using a dashboard so everything's in one place um day four tied into 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 the communications recording is, is reporting and data disclosure and here you know uh, talk about this jigsaw effect of uh of compliance and regulations um what we have coming down the road as you know is the general data protection regime and that really affects um MIFID 2 as well, because it's really about the reporting requirements and making sure that's all uh, disclosed in, in, a, in a uniform, easily um, um, uh, understandable fashion. So reporting and data disclosure across the services that you offer, uh, particularly with GDPR, is, is really important. When it comes to GDPR next year, we're very pleased to be supporting Money Info around the country and, and doing a talk on GDPR where we cover seven key areas that need to be in place. Um, and yes, advisor firms, planner firms need to have them in place. They can't just say it's there, that the, the data is being held by the CRM system, etc. No, it's because it's your client data. You need to make sure that you're up to speed with GDPR. So that's all about lawfulness of holding the data, informed consent from a client perspective that they're allowing you to hold the data, giving them opt-in, opt-out, uh, purpose limitation, how long you're holding it for, data minimization. In other words, it's not war and peace, only hold the data that you need to hold. Make sure it's clean and accurate. Rubbish in, rubbish out. That's important. Uh, storage limitation and the integrity of the data and confidentiality of the data needs to be 
um, respected. There's also the issue about what we call the 10% drop rule, which is the um, obligation to report if portfolios drop between uh, be, be, by 10% or multiples thereof in each quarter. And, and the key issue from this point of view, even though it is uh, technically the DFM uh, responsibility, you know your clients better than anything. You, I hate this phrase, who owns the client? Nobody owns the client in my opinion, but you have a really good fundamental understanding of your clients because you've done a great job with them. And the issue there is that in more ways than one, don't just have a hands-off approach to this. Make sure that you are very much hands-on and you are doing a really, uh, you've got a really detailed understanding of how these DFMs are approaching this. Put it in your, in your agreement with them about how they're going to approach your clients and making sure you hold them to account on that. And also make sure that it's an opportunity for you to go and see your clients or revisit your clients, review your clients, if God forbid this should happen. So, you know, that's that's really what this does. So, so from, from, from that perspective, what I mean by um, that is, is that this is a massive opportunity uh, for you to keep your clients close. Day five. Um, the advice definition changed this year. I don't know if you saw this, but certainly the HMT came in with MIFID 2 um, um, test, which looks at the MIFID's definition of advice as a personal recommendation, not just a, a, a you know um, uh, regulated activities 54, which is a wider investment recommendation, which is good news because that helps you with suitability testing. So, you know, not in other words, you can offer guidance information, which is outside the suitability requirement if you're not offering a personal recommendation. So, for example, you can offer guidance on long term care. You can offer guidance on uh, ISA top ups, on pension transfers, whatever it is, um, without, off, you know, with the fear, if you like, of the suitability requirements there. So this hopefully answers, helps answer the what is advice and what is guidance. And that's why we've called it if it looks like an elf in this phrase, it's actually what if it looks like a duck. Um, it is a duck. And, um, you know, it was James, the poet James Whitcomb Riley, who wrote, when I see a bird that walks like a duck and swims like a duck and quacks like a duck, I call that a duck. So it's very important to know what is advice now, what's terms of advice under the MIFID definition um, and what the FCA and the HMT are coming out with on this um, is, is really key. So, look, if it looks like an elf, it is an elf. That's that's the key issue here. Um, and knowing when suitability applies and when it doesn't can help you build your guidance um, structure as you go forward. Day six, suitability uh, and key questions to ask. So Adam Owen has written this the, the next couple of slides for us. Adam um, sits um, with Engage um, as a consultant uh, and uh, does a lot of good work with us uh, with clients on um, on personal development skills and on business professional development. Uh, Adam's slides here really cut to the chase on this. Um, when we're talking about assessing suitability, you have to do this on an annual basis for sure. But there's some good key questions here that you can sense check about what you're doing, how you're doing it, you know, looking at your file checks, how it all works, making sure that, you know, your, 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 your suitability um, is in the zone of where the regulator want you to sit with this. So really your sense checking should be around explaining risk in a way that customer understands it, uh, if you're using risk scales, if you discuss different investment types, agreeing with customer where they sit on that scale when making recommendations, have you researched the choices for investment and provide a mar manager market sufficiently? Have you explained to the customer the external factors such as change in interest rates, property markets, etc., how that affects their financial situation? And have you explained the risks attached to the product or action recommended in a way that the customer is likely to understand? We've also got the impact of volatility on portfolio, so the capacity for loss issue, and making sure that's separate from the ATR. We've seen a bit that confused or fudged in the market. That needs to change. Um, looking at you know the 10% drop rule, for example, sustained drop in investment returns, how you're tackling that. Um, I've talked about the confusion of capacity loss with risk appetite, failing to assess capacity for loss in conjunction with clients' returned requ return requirements, and making assumptions. You know, bias management here regarding younger, wealthier clients have a higher loss capacity that might not necessarily be the case for it so dealing with clients in a case-by-case -case scenario is important um and other areas really consider using cash flow modeling for example um to demonstrate the impact of future losses knowing stochastic versus deterministic um cash flow modeling and atr uh, modeling if you like for your clients um you know because that helps make it far more tangible for your clients i think that's quite quite good and, and involving that in your in your suitability reporting as well is, is a key area um, we've then got um, advice, um, evidencing advice, day seven. And really what we're talking about here is, is aligned to your suitability is, 
you know, um, putting together an advice, you know, an advice register, looking at, you know, when no advice um, is given and, and documenting that, when your kit might not be suitable, whether you're unable to provide suitable advice at any stage, clients advise on hold, sell. What we haven't put up there is insistent clients and how you're dealing with those guys. Uh, all that needs to go in. Um, you know, other issues um, that, that, that come into this, um, for example, are legal entity identifiers, if they're going to be required, whether the client is not an individual within, within the business and you're offering advice in this area. So if a client is acting under a legal entity or a structure, such as a company, charity or trust, um, you know, th then they may require a legal entity identi and identifier. Um, and then file reviews. Um, well, there we're talking about, you know, business checks, write documents, fact finds, disclosure, suitability reports, stand, uh, uh, you know, they're making sure they're all in, in, in place. Then you're looking at a standardized approach to your file reviews in evidencing advice regarding risk warnings, comprehensive completion of your documents and, 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 and all that type of stuff. And then you've got outcome generated issues regarding client informed consent across all advice and suitability areas and tax planning and the rest of it that goes with it. So, so really what we're asking you to do there is sense check your advice process and evidencing the advice that you're giving to your client, which then goes rolls in really to what we'd mentioned before about your annual suitability reviews. Now this is an area, day eight is really an area that some firms forget or don't kind of factor in which is Prod 3.3, which is all about really product governance. And really that's all about understanding financial instruments distributed to clients, assessing compatibility with financial instruments with client needs, ensure distributed, they're distributed when in the best interest of the client. It might sound straightforward, but it can be discounted because in many ways, um, product providers, that, that a lot of uh, firms think, well, this is a product provider issue. Yes, it is because they have to identify their target market. They have to prove that their products are appropriate uh, for client needs at all times. But the issue with this as well is that you need to ensure that it dovetails into your client segmentation approach and make sure that you know those client, those you know, the research and due diligence is done on these products on a continuous basis as per, for example, TR161, which was a paper that came out um, nearly two years ago now, which really looked at are you challenging um, the product providers, uh, you, you're making sure, and platform providers, you're making sure uh, that they are, you know, that, that they are meeting the client needs on an ongoing basis. You're making sure that you're not suffering from status quo bias, that you're just happy with the way things are without testing, uh, and you're not retrofitting, shoehorning clients into unsuitable uh, centralized investment propositions, for example. Um, distribution strategy, client type, knowledge and experience, loss capacity, objectives, needs, etc. Well, this is all important for the product provider, but we'd also say it's just as important for you guys, uh, particularly with your investment wealth com committees. I'm sure you do this anyway, but again, stress testing these areas are very important, um, particularly when it comes down to product governance. Day nine, we're going to get festive here again. So we're talking about um, really um, spot the difference between the products that you've got. There's a whole argument regarding what's complex and what are non-complex products. Non-complex are generally what are called NERS, most non-usage retail schemes, funds, ETFs, investment trusts in general. There is a question mark about ETFs, um, but in very much the FCA's kind of set on the fence between complex and non-complex. It's up to you guys to, to put the test in place. Um, where complex products are, well, certainly convertible loan stocks, subscription shares, deriv derivatives, property infrastructure funds, or any fund that has a liquidity issue is really in the complex box. And our mantra on this is if in doubt, leave it out. So if you're involved in structured products, for example, so, you know, you've gone down the route of getting structured product uh, deposit permissions. Um, well, look, you know, if there's liquidity issues at any stage, then you might want to think about um, not proceeding with that particular product range or at least questioning it and putting research and due diligence around it. Day 10, centralized investment proposition, keep testing your KIP on an ongoing basis, ideally quarterly through your investment committees. Make sure your client profiles are, you know, it's all suitable for your clients, which I'm sure you do. Um, looking at the objectives um, of, um, of the committees uh, and looking at your risk management approach, internal documentation, ongoing management of your KIP and your service propositions. Due diligence and controls are kind of married up here, but you know we've talked a lot about this regarding prod and suitability, uh, making sure everything um, is, um, is in place, that you've got your research and due diligence processes there. 
that you've got your disclosure, you've got your terms of business and agreements in place. You're, you know, you're robustly uh, controlling um, the um, the drop rule, the 10% drop rule in there. You've got the reporting, the recording issues we talked about and the practice management issues in place. And an action planning is important um, regarding that because, you know, we're not a fan of checklist tick box mentality to compliance and business development. We just think that's old school. It's very much like driving a car through a rear view mirror. Um, and, you know, you, you can't really see what's coming down the horizon. You need to be far more proactive uh, and strategic in your approach, which is what RegTech does, which I'll talk about in a little while. Uh, but the key areas here is really agreeing actions, what time scale, who's accountable and getting the resources kicked in to make sure that the culture is right for managing all the risks. Um, in the business, which is what Miffy 2 wants you to see. And finally, the kit pitch I put in there, really, it's all about, you know, how you're explaining and presenting your kit to the, your clients, the regulators, stakeholders in the business, making sure it's clear, concise and simple. Uh, and obviously, it's regulatory referenced for, for, for professional development purposes. Going to day 11, we are very much, as I've said, moving away from checklist tick box mentality put together a risk matrix, put together a, 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 a risk approach to MIFID 2 to make sure that all these key issues that we've talked about, you know, legal identifying application, um, structured um, uh, deposit um, permissions, um, looking at governance, aggregated costs, um, recording communications, the rest of it, put it all in there. Um, and then rag rate it, red, amber, green rate it, look at your definition of your red, amber, amber, green, and then look at what you need to do through action planning to take it forward. Now, actually, this is what Model Office does, in essence, for you as a business. It will rag rate, uh, it will do more than rag rating, actually, it has more colours to it, but the algorithm will then kick out steers and strategies about what you need to do next as a business moving forward. Day 12, finally, is all about really moving back to that fact that, you know, we need to build a balanced scorecard across all these regulations coming down the line. There's much more to it than meets the eye. You've got the um, uh, insurance distribution directive coming through as well, which we haven't put up there. Uh, that's interesting because I think that brings in a requirement for, um, I think, 15 hours of structured CPD to be included if you're using protection products um, within your CPD. So that needs to be blended in. Um, but you've got, you know, any specialist services that you're offering. Um, MIFID 2 sits in there. SMCR, KYC, TCF, anti-money laundering and GDPR we've talked about. Um, it all fits together. It all slots together. Don't look, look at it from a silo checklist point of view. Look at it from a like a, a, a holistic balanced scorecard across the business so you can make sure that you're sense checking all these key issues on an ongoing basis. And what Model Office does is it does that for you because it has five keys um, that you can focus on. So your focus is all about the strategic planning and the compliance planning and the key financial ratios, the risks and controls. Your engagement is all about your uh, client engagement, and stakeholder engagement within the business, marketing, client documents, digital framework that you've got in place. Your promise is all about your service proposition, centralized investment proposition, uh, and your technology that goes with that. Your systems is all about your back office practice management technology, your CRM systems, your data flows, the quality of your data, the GDPR all sits there. And your people is all about your human resource development, your talent management programs, and looking at how the APA, the approved Persian regime, will be morphing over into the senior management certification regime going forward. So this is how our RegTech platform looks. If you're going through the, the platform, key one, your, your focus, strategy, governance, key financial and managing risk, risk strategic planning is the business function here. And you can see from this really it looks at asking your question where you can answer it in a Likert scale format on the right hand side. But also it asks you to check, it gives you resources, pop up resources, check out the FCA's MIFID final policy statement. So you can actually get more context on what you're being asked to so that you can actually then apply that to the answer. Uh, and, and you know, in an open, honest way, because it is subject, it's your subjective, it is your journey, not our journey. So you need to be, you know, open and honest with yourself and how you're answering this. And then what Mo will do is give you steers and strategies as you go through. So you can see here, you know, this is asking you a different area about client and stakeholder engagement and gives you a pop-up resource into ESMA's question and answers on MIFID 2 to give you more resource on that. And what you'll get eventually is a balanced scorecard, um, a dashboard across the business, giving you a strategic plan and also radar charts as well as um, 
like, like Fitbit um, performance styles across each of the five keys. But most importantly, it'll give you steers and strategies and guidance about what to do next. And what will happen with the next upgrade with, Mo with Model Office is you're going to get a regulatory dashboard which will replace this, where you'll have tiles across each of the business functions you'll be able to click into. It'll give you all the resources that you need to start to improve your performance and just sense check against what these regulations uh, need from you on an ongoing basis. And the key area that RegTech can help you with is, is that second area on benefits, which is time, cost savings, and de-risking the business. The FAMA report the, uh, that came out, the benchmark report that came out with the FCA in June, I think it was, looked at average compliance costs of 11%, where 3% were direct and 8% were indirect. Um, Mo, we have 75 users on the Mo platform, and um, we are confident that we can reduce that indirect compliance cost by at least a couple of percent. We're already speaking to a number of PI insurer firms, and those firms um, like the concept of Mo because they can actually see, get a thumbprint, digital thumbprint, if you like, of the risk on their books with what their firms are doing and how they're improving their scores, their compliance scores on an ongoing basis, which potentially could help them reduce the cost of PI insurance. So I'm a big fan of that. I've been an advisor for 10 years. So from that perspective, my bias, if you like, is with you to uh, ensure that, you know, you uh, stay around because the industry needs you. Um, but also that we're helping you become more um, more compliant and more competitive um, and more profitable as a business as you move forward. Finally, but not least, wish you a very Merry Christmas and a prosperous and happy new year. Um, hopefully that's given you a, uh, a an idea of, of 12 key areas that you can look to apply to your business. If you've got any questions, please email us through our email is there, info at model-office.co.uk or you can uh, go online and check out Model Office. We have a free version and a full platform version. We have a chatbot entering the market next year, which will be artificial intelligence driven, which will allow you to interrogate the handbook, the FCA handbook, and also your business to find out a bit more about how you can improve. You'll have an open API that will go back into your CRM system and your back office system to pull out more meaningful data from a regulatory reporting point of view. So in more ways than one, we, you know, again, it's allowing you to think more proactively, strategically across the business, move away from that silo checklist driven uh, mentality um, and build this balanced scorecard um, so you know that you are highly compliant, client centric and sustainable. Thanks for your time. And uh, next year, we are producing a whole load of GDPR, uh, web tech, reg, reg tech, um, uh, sorry, reg tech webinars um, across the GDPR uh, in, 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 in aligning with our work with uh, Money Info. So wish you a very, all Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and uh, speak to you in 2018.